Hello and welcome to Access Chat. We are absolutely made up to welcome back to Access Chat, Caroline Casey. Caroline has been doing amazing things over the last year or so, but particularly it's exploded in the last week or so <laughs> because Caroline has managed to get disability onto the main agenda at Davos at World Economic Forum uh, and has launched the valuable 500 campaign to get 500 CEOs signed up to put disability onto the board agenda in their companies and to report on it. And she's also launched an amazing and very funny video taking the mick out of diverse-ish companies, which I'm sure she's going to talk about. So welcome back, Caroline. It's fantastic to have you with us. Can you tell us a bit more about it all? Well, first of all, it's absolutely amazing to be back and having a conversation with you you know how many months on was it 14 months ago that i had this yes. crazy plan um and, and what a year <laughs> what a year so um and it's wonderful to have access chat as one of our expert partners as well so yeah it's been it's amazing uh it's been overwhelming in some respects and it just shows how much this has been wanted and needed um so I think for us, um, we're just a week out from what happened in Davos. It was on the 24th of January um, with the full support of the World Economic Forum and the leadership of Paul Pullman, who was one of our first hashtag valuable leaders, that we managed to secure the main stage in Davos and we had disability business inclusion being spoken about by five of the world's biggest brands and CEOs. And it's something when you can get Procter & Gamble and Unilever on the same stage. So that was pretty impressive. Um, but preceding that, um, we had a press conference, a WEF press conference, where we launched the Valuable 500 with another five CEOs. So whew, it was a big deal. And then the excitement for us was we launched out into the world our hashtag Diversish Films, which is sort of giving the... It's a satirical um, take on what's happening in the diversity and inclusion space in business. It's simply saying that you cannot say that you prioritize diversity as a company if you do not have disability on your board agenda. Um, and we have a, a wonderful stat that goes out through that, that film, which is saying that 90% of companies prioritize diversity, but 4% recognize disability. So, we have 96% of the companies to get on board for the Valuable 500. That's a, that's a, you know, it's a great summary and uh, it's, it's a fantastic achievement what you've managed to do to pull together the, the group of people that you have because they're really significant movers and shakers in the world of business and we sincerely hope that this is going to influence other very important business leaders to, to make that difference. We, we know that when we talked a while back now and talked with also with Fleur from EY that when LGBT issues got raised at Davos a few years ago it was a watershed moment and yeah. it was at that point that uh, LGBT issues started being accepted as part of the diversity agenda in companies so I'm, I'm really hopeful that, that the same is going to happen for, for disability. I, I feel it in my waters uh, because I, I, I can see it happening. I know that we're all 100% behind you on this one and, and, and uh, I'm, I'm excited. Deborah, I know you're going to have something to say. Of course, I'm going to have something to say because I'm just so excited and I, um, and I was really a kudos to Mr. Mr. Neal. Mr. Neal for getting Caroline to come on today when it's, she's so fresh on of Davos. So, Caroline, I, I know your incredible background, but I don't know that all of the audience does. So can you maybe tell us a little bit about what you've done? Because I remember when I was on the board of USBLN, it's now Disability Colon IN, there was something happening in Ireland and we were like, whoa, what are y'all doing over there? And we were so amazed. And so do, do you mind just going a little back in history about what you've done? I know there's elephants involved and horses involved, but oh, you have such a rich history. And now you've got disability inclusion on the world stage. We, we love you, Caroline, we do. <laughs> so maybe um, you could just talk about how'd you get here? Um. 
Well, uh, it is 19 years. Um, so this wasn't an overnight success by any stretch of the imagination. I was working for Excel 19 years ago. Um, I had not declared that I was registered legally blind. Uh, I had fooled them, and the joke often is, is well, how did I fool a management consultancy firm? But I had. Um, and it was in the close of um, 1999 that I finally came out of the closet and openly declared that I needed some help, which was not the easiest thing to do because I had got on, I thought, quite well by not uh, by hiding my disability. Um, and so really, I think that put into play everything that's happened since. I was encouraged to take some time off to let my eyes rest because I had temporarily damaged them. And I also had to come face to face with my own act of discrimination because I didn't own my own disability. Um, and I think that was a lot about fear. I was frightened that I wouldn't be accepted or I wouldn't belong or that I wouldn't be allowed to live the life that I wanted. Um, and of course, the irony of it is, once I owned that I had a visual impairment, my life has become, oh my God, way, way better, way bigger. Um, and also, I got to reach that potential that we all hope that, that we can do. So I began my um, journey into disability business inclusion um, by um, fulfilling a childhood dream and leaving Accenture as a management consultant and becoming an elephant handler. Uh, and riding across India on an elephant. And that was as much, that was as much for me to regain the confidence in myself, actually. Um, but what it turned out to be was a, a kind of campaign about what, what I saw disability being. It, for me, I didn't want to be defined by a medical condition or an impairment. And the more questions, because you can only imagine an Irish albino girl on an elephant in India got some attention from the media, and so I found out I had a voice, and I was being asked questions, and there were questions I couldn't answer. And I had no idea of the scale of the disability inequality crisis. I had no idea about it. But because I was so naive in some ways, I was like, well, where's business <laughs> in this conversation? Um, I had no, I just had no idea that it was such a problem. And it was just at the time that the green movement was emerging, and I was like, well, if business is going to be involved in the environment, why are they not talking about 20% of our population? And so that's really what triggered my interest in disability business inclusion. And for the last 18 years since then, I have been on that roller coaster, very passionately believing that if the most powerful force on the planet, business, does not recognize the value and the worth and the contribution and potential of just under 20% of our market, then how are we ever going to close that inequality gap? And so the work that we began to do was first to change the narrative within business around disability and potential. Um, I had learned very early on, um, I had some great mentors, uh, that if you want to change business, you kind of need to go to the point of influence, and that was the boards and the CEOs. And so that's where a lot of our work began. Um, and then we recognize that business, business leaders and business brands have ego. Uh, and so I was looking at, well, what influences them? So what we set up was, the, in Ireland, the first of its kind, a thing called the Ability Awards. And it was a national program which was identifying best practice across the full supply chain of a business so that we could highlight the role models as leaders and companies to try and encourage further best practice. And that was an incredibly successful program, but the most important part of that program was we refused to work with any company unless the CEO was fully committed, signed off, and present. And that's really interesting because when we look at the Valuable 500, that's where we've, where we've put our focus. And so I think in Ireland, by the second year that the Ability Awards ran, it became the most sought-after business award a company wanted. And that soon was very uh, quickly taken over by Telefonica, one of the biggest telecommunications companies in the world, and it was exported to Spain. So in the years that we did that, we, I think we worked with over 470 companies. We had 1,200 case studies of best practice across supply chain, spoken to half a million leaders, 
in one day of a campaign alone in Spain, we reached 52 million people. So it's a lot of the things that we learned in doing the Ability Awards, which is about campaign and leadership and storytelling and best practice and partnership, is what underpins the Valuable 500. Excellent. That's a, yeah, that's a great background. Um, I think that um, tying that back into what you were talking about, about owning your own disability, I think that's, that's tremendously important. Something that I'm passionate about as well. I, I often talk about me being the most senior person in my company with a disability. I'm not, but I'm the most <laughs> senior person because I'm not that senior. I, I'm, I'm relatively, but um, realistically, there are there are people above me that will have what would qualify as a disability that would never talk about it, and well, that yeah, was something that okay. came up in your survey. Uh, that EY did yeah. for you um, for Valuable because out of, what was it, 7% of the people surveyed, the C-suite that were surveyed, um, only, sorry, out of the people that were surveyed, 7% said that they had a personal connection with disability and so that's yeah. sort of half of the overall global population. Yes. So, so it's yeah. like 50% already down and then even 5% 5, 5 of that said that they were uncomfortable. Um, Actually, it, it was more shocking, Neil. It was of that 7%, four out of five refused to disclose their disability. Oh, uh, yeah. So, so it, was, it was actually, yeah. So it was about 5% of the, t yeah. So, wow. So, yeah, pretty much every one of them didn't want to talk yeah. about it. No. Because, because of the culture of invincibility uh, and exactly. infallibility. You know, you need to be Superman to be the CEO, right? Yeah, and I mean, I can really relate to that. And one of the things that really shocked me is when I, when I launched Hashtag Valuable, which was the last time we spoke, which was in 2017, it was the precursor for the Valuable 500. Um, I thought I was so disappointed in is that even though we'd all been working, so many of us, for decades, that when I went to talk to them about this valuable, Hashtag Valuable idea, I interviewed 53 companies. And every one of them basically said, no, we don't have the resources for this. We're focusing on other things. And I realized things hadn't changed. And um, so when I, when I eventually got hashtag valuable going, I kind of employed the same craziness that I had done with an elephant and I rode across Columbia on a horse. And I very uncomfortably came face to face again with my own disability in that journey. And it really, it shocked me um, that for, for years I'd been campaigning about self-acceptance and about ability and potential and owning who you are. And yet when I came back to doing a campaign again, I found that I was maybe not as further along as I thought. And I think the reason for that is because it had just broken my heart to see that the issue of disability business and inclusion was still so far behind. And it was still so unequal on the disability agenda. And I think I really had a, yeah, a real come to, mo a come to Jesus moment um, that has really fueled me through the last 18 months. Um, and a lot of that is because we don't see leaders declaring they have a disability. We don't see CEOs talking about disability in the same way we have around, you know, sustainability or the environment or gender. And without that ownership, without leaders owning it and, and talking about it or being confident, I just don't think that, that it's going to change. I think the change is going to be so slow, and that's why the Valuable 500 is so focused on leadership accountability and creating an open and conf uh, a space for leaders to be confident about it. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's fantastic. Antonio, I know you, you had a point you wanted to make. My point is, uh, many senior executives, they are uh, on their 60s or late 50s. So they actually are in the certain age group that uh, it means that many of them might have a disability. You know? uh, we, no, I can tell, we, we did the work here in Cork in, the, in a program that we call Healthy Cities, and that, uh, where we look at people's age groups and, and it matches with that as well, that people get a disability as long as they age. So, and, and there's a strong 
uh, grow in terms of the percentage when people reach that age group. So I think there's something there's a there's a pattern there, and that business are not excluded from. Yeah, I think that's like I think that's probably a sweet spot for all of us right now. And when you look at the panel at the World Economic Forum, the one thing that I noticed, um, and we it was it was a really human conversation, and we had Peter Grauer, who's the chair of Bloomberg, and you had Paul Poman both over the age of 60, I imagine, I think. And then everybody else was sort of, I imagine, somewhere late 40s, 50s. But when Paul and Peter um, opened up about, I think, their own connection to disability, and also that they recognise that it hadn't been done, it became a very human conversation. And what happened on that panel is we started talking about disability in the very human context, and we were all we were constantly talking about it in business, but we were talking about it in a human way, and we we constantly forget that 80% of that 1.3 billion acquire the disability between the ages of 18 and 64. But to your point, Antonio, so many board members of big companies are over the age of 64. So when we put the aging demographic and the disability demographic together, we're talking a massive part of this population, and. I just think it's crazy. It's it's a it's a massive business risk, you know, to leave this out. Um, and but particularly in a time of hyper competition, and you know, the economic case is already made. We know it. We know what the return on investment is. It's just we have to get we have to get beyond this obstacle of not wanting to talk about it or to getting it wrong or we haven't done enough. I think Peter Grauer really. Was incredibly honest when he said, "I just realised as a business leader, I haven't done enough." And we're like, "But that's okay. We we'll just begin. <laughs> you know, let's begin." But you are accountable for the companies that you run. It's not your DNI people. It's not your HR people. You're accountable, and so that's why disability needs to come up to you. Caroline, uh, the other day I was, <clears throat> I was doing, I was in a, I was giving a speech on a panel, and somebody in the audience said. Um, what do you think the greatest barrier, or the greatest barriers are for the you know community of people with disabilities? And I said uh, nobody wants to join the community, and they just all looked at me. And I said, now I was speaking in the United States, and so I said I can see and in this audience, and the reality is I know many of you would fall under the Americans with Disabilities Act definition of people with disabilities, and you might think that I'm insulting you, and I'm not, because being Human means that you have disabilities. My husband's 66, and I've talked about this before, and he has dementia, which is a scary thing. And but but and my daughter has Down syndrome, so my daughter was born with it. My husband acquired it, but my husband still it has things to do and things to achieve in his life. So I also see in the United States, Caroline, that. We've done so much and done so little. We've spent so much and had such little gains. I love the diverse-ish because I, I remember speaking at a SHRM conference and, and it was disability, excuse me, it was diversity. And the the trainer said, tell me what's in diversity. And so they all were naming different things and I just sat and waited. I just waited for disabilities to come in and they, they started closing it down. They had like 20 of them on there and still. No, no, we were not mentioned. And so they were about to close it and I ha held my hand up and I said, disabilities? And they're like, oh yeah, 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 yeah. So I am starting to see something that I'm a little troubled with and I don't know how to solve it. And, I, and that's why we're so proud to be part of the Valuable 500. But there's, a, I, uh, so I'll just tell a story. There was this very, very large multinational brand in the United States that wanted to really include people with disabilities. So they hired a young woman that was 23 years old um, and she has a disability, a physical disability. But she had no experience in our field except she's lived it, and which is beautiful. And this company actually failed quite a bit, and they're actually moving out of this market now. And so there seems to be something now that people are saying, well, unless you have a physical disability, you don't belong in this, which is troubling to me because if that's the case, then Neil shouldn't be in the conversation, I shouldn't be in the conversation. Uh, Antonio's wife, who ha lives with chronic pain, she shouldn't be in the conversation. So how do we even own who we are as a community instead of stop saying, well, 
what are you doing in the conversation, Deborah? Yeah, your husband has a disability. Your daughter has a disability. You have depression, ADHD. So now we're starting to get into that and how does business address this? So I, I know that's a big question, but. No, it's not. It's the question I'm really passionate about, actually. Um, well, number one, that kind of an attitude that you're referring to, that's an attitude of exclusion. I'm sorry, but it is. I don't think any of us have to justify how disabled or not we are, or how much we experience disability or not. Like, who's, who, who gets to say that? I mean, that just really upsets me. You know, and the greatest chance that we have is stop competing on levels of exclusion. There shouldn't be a hierarchy of exclusion or disability. And actually, that's one of the biggest problems that exists in the corporate world when we are pitting one excluded group against the other. And that's why we can't have universal inclusion. So when we talk about the disability community, the people who are greatest, who have a, a huge effect on their lives, it's not just me, it's my husband, it's my mom, it's my brother who has two sisters who have, are visually impaired. It matters to him. It matters to my sister's child. Um, you know, I don't see why they don't have a voice. And actually our greatest allies, our greatest chance, by the way, of getting any of this right about full human inclusion is our allies. We are all allies in inclusion, regardless of what it is. We have no right to decide who's in that group or not. And I think the greatest chance we have, particularly around disability inclusion, is to call in our allies, because collectively that actually makes the whole world, right? So how yes, can you ignore yes. the whole world? How can you oh, ignore us? I and, know. Oh. And I don't, for one moment, I am not saying, I believe that we, people with disabilities, need to be part of the conversation about what solutions are there for us. And there is no one solution that fits all. But I have no intention of leaving out the voices of the people that love me. Why would I do that? And we because, love you. And we do yeah. love you. <laughs> no, but I mean, why would you? No, I you're mean, right. My I know, mom it's ridiculous. has a voice. Yeah, my right. mom has a voice. And my husband has a voice. But my friends have a voice. And actually, their voices nearly shout harder for me than I've done. So let's just get over that. Can we just move on? Because it's, you know, we all have a right to our voice. And let's work together on trying to make an inclusive world for everybody. Let's stop, let's stop playing these games. There's no point. And actually, in doing that, we're making it very, very, very difficult for business. Because one of the things that has been maybe a barrier, I don't know what you guys think, is because the disability community have found it very hard to come together because it's been so difficult to get visibility and funding for all of our work. Um, so it's very hard for us to convene. And so I just hope that maybe the valuable 500 is something that we all can benefit from because I don't really care what your experience of disability is. I just want us to be recognized equally within the business agenda. So let's not fight who gets more visibility than the other. Oh, well said, well said. Antonio has a question. No, um, it, it, this is something that we, I think we discussed this on, on previous chats. It's just uh, um, in in early in early to, in early 2019, a few uh, people commenting about uh, Cosme experience, especially from outcomes they got from companies like Gartner and Forrester and, and others, where where they claim that there's not been a real progress in the outcomes of all the investments in Cosme experience. And in some, some organizations I realize, well, probably are, we're not going to invest as many money as we did in the past because we're not really seeing a result from our initiatives. But no, but if you look back to those initiatives, they have been systematically ignoring uh, accessibility in the way how they design those experiences. And even the analysts sometimes, they are to blame because they just don't even bring this to the conversation. So I see there's a, you know, you have the chance to speak with uh, two executives who lead uh, global organizations with, with, with products who have a huge impact on the life of consumers. So if we start to looking at accessibility from a perspective of how can we improve customer experience, not only from online, but also when you go to a supermarket, and you are able to buy a product and know what product is in the shelf, I think there's a huge potential of increasing, uh, one, there's a business benefit for organizations, and then 
people feel part, people can benefit from being able to do better choices when they consume in their daily lives. Yeah, I think, look, the point that you've made, first of all, is probably one of the most important for me, that when we talk about the, the issue of disability in business, people default to talk about employment alone. And actually, we should be talking about the full value or supply chain of the business, because that's really where this is at. And one of the most important parts right now is the consumer. So when we were on the panel uh, in Davos, you could hear both Unilever and Procter & Gamble speaking about exactly what you're talking about. Tactile labeling, actually, was one of the things they spoke about. But the other thing that we talked about was in advertising. So where are we seeing ourselves in the advertising space? Um, and also, when and there's a brilliant example, um, Urban Decay, which is one of L'Oreal's brands, that they actually have had um, tutorials online uh, by deaf people for putting on makeup, and then they put that into their stores. So it's actually starting to integrate in a meaningful way, but not in a, just a piecemeal way. How can we make this mainstream? How can we scale these ideas? So they're just not these cute projects, but they're actually something that's available to all. I guess in the same way that that remote control that we all hold our fists to was designed for visually impaired blind people and now becomes part of our lives. So there are brilliant ideas, fantastic initiatives, but we're not seeing them scale. And I think a lot of the reason that we're not seeing them scale is because there's not an understanding of the genuine strategic opportunity that exists around this market. It's still sort of seen as a CSRE. So when we look at the brand benefits and the strategic benefits of it, then I think we'll see that scale. But the only, reason, the only way we're going to see that happen, if we include the CMOs, the chief marketing officers, if it's going up to board level, if it's part of it, so the resources are released to actually spread these ideas and initiatives. But it needs leadership from the top to release the resources right throughout the organization. I think that's that's a great point. I think that that CSR is a, a double-edged sword, right? Because I think that that um, there is a lot of good stuff that happens within yeah. CSR, but people sometimes view it cynically because they don't necessarily tie it to true business impact. I think there are a couple of things that you and I have discussed before uh, offline, which can make a difference there. So there are a couple of really report uh, important reporting indices. For CSR. Yes, yes. Um, so, so one is the Dow Jones Sustainability Index, yep. the other is the, the Global Reporting uh, Initiative. Yep. These particular uh, uh, ways of reporting have an impact on the bottom line of companies because they affect their share value, because people look at them and they, um, they make buy or sell decisions about shares. Now, CEOs and board members care about that deeply. Right? So if we are to make the connection between disability, CSR and real business impact and value, yeah. we need to be making sure that disability inclusion or exclusion and, uh, and I've been comparing it to pollution uh, because it's yes, an externality, it's because our products and our services yeah. that we are delivering are excluding people and other people are making the cost, then it needs to be included in this reporting and it needs yes. to have an impact on the bottom line. And once they yeah. can see that impact, then then we will scale. Well, actually, it's one of our um, KPIs, sorry to sound all management consultancy, so I'm still a management consultant. So we have several KPIs for the success of the Valuable 500. Um, one of them is to hopefully working with all of you out there to help us ensure that disability is included in the Dow Jones Sustainability Index by next Davos, that's Davos by 2020, as a start. And then it should be in every single performance index and indicator that exists for business. If we get to that one, then we should be able to penetrate it down. Because that means that we will see business care and it'll just be part of rather than something separate rather than a different index or a new one, another thing they have to do. So why don't we blend it and integrate disability into what already exists? And I could not agree with you more. So one of our big sort of asks to everybody who's interested in this space, this is something we'd really love to be able to manage to do. And we've started begun working on it. I know, Neil, you have a huge interest in this. But I think that's something that will have systemic change, right? Because it's part yeah. of a system. 
and it means it's already there so why can we not be integrated or add into it absolutely and and the thing is you know we we see this stuff already i mean gri has stuff on disability inclusion it's just that you can ignore it so <laughs> just make it mandatory you know it's well, I think it should it's be. as simple as that you know i think you, it should you, be you, you know, you, it, it's it's really not hard. Yeah, you know, make it mandatory to report on this stuff. You've already got the framework. It's in GRI version four. So, yeah. um, sorry, I'm getting technical, but the GRI version no. four is the latest version of the Global Reporting Initiative. Yeah. They have mapped a whole bunch of stuff to the um, UN Convention on Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Yeah. Um, they're looking at making it better. I keep asking them to make it mandatory and the more of us and the more businesses that say that they actually would welcome this, then I think the more likely it is to happen. And, and certainly I'm going to be putting uh, all of my post Christmas weight behind it. Well, I think the thing is, who's going to help make that happen? It's the business leaders. And yeah. so I think if we get a group of business leaders to make sure that that happens, then we've got a better chance, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so I, I think we're, we're pretty much at the end of our half hour. It always goes way too quickly, with you, quick. even though you can speak at 500 words per minute. This um, is slow for me. <laughs> I know, I know. I've seen I'm making an effort. Too. I know. So uh, we obviously need to thank the, our, our supporters in business, Barclays and My Clear Text, who uh, do well, amazing Barclays are one of our Barclays were one of the very first to become yeah. a valuable 500 company. Yes, no, we know. We saw um, Ashok on the stage with you um, and talking about the, 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 you know, the choose your own credit card and high vis credit cards. Really important, you know. Yeah. I have, uh, a, 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 I have a, we have a bank account with Barclays, um, and, you know, but I also have a personal bank account somewhere else, and the cards are not visible. I actually, when I have to read out the card number, I have to tip it to the light so that I can actually see where they're raised. So that's an example of poor physical world accessibility, whereas, you know, it's easy to get it right. So um, they've been getting it right for a long time. So thank you, Caroline. We, we, we know that we're going to have a great Twitter chat with you. Let's just remind people, go and watch the video on YouTube. It's diverse-ish. Yes, yeah. it's, a, it's a hoot. It's a great video. Um, if you're a business leader, come and join the Valuable 500, hashtag Valuable 500. And of course, on Tuesday, join us for hashtag Access Chat. Thank you once again. It's been a Thank you, real guys. Pleasure. Thank you for everything. Thank you so much. We believe in you.